Today's first topic we're going to look at are ocean currents and the sea surface temperature actually influences the air temperature so our surface currents and our wind patterns are very similar. We have that warmer water at the equator that moves towards the poles where it cools down, sinks, and moves back to the equator. Now around the equator you're going to have higher evaporation rates because your sea surface temperature is higher where the sunlight is more direct. So that creates the surface circulation. So it's about 10%, just the upper 400 meters roughly of the ocean that creates these surface currents. 90% of the ocean is part of the deep water currents in the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, which we'll take a look at. And the deep currents are affected by differences in density. Temperature and salinity both are factors that are going to affect the density of the water. So what we're looking at in this map are the surface currents. You can see those that originate around the equator are in red. Those are our warm currents and those that originate closer to the poles are in blue, those are our cold currents. Upwelling is created when trade winds blow um, the surface water away from the coast. So here you've got trade winds are near the equator and you can see they're moving the, the water away. And so when that happens, the colder nutrient rich water the colder nutrient rich uh, water from the bottom is going to rise to the surface or upwell and take its place. Um, and this is very important because it brings nutrients to the to the surface that the fishing industry really depends on um, to provide the nutrients their fish need in the fish nurseries. Now El Nino and something that happens in the southern Pacific Ocean off of the coast of South America um, actually affects these upwellings. It occurs every few years. Um, you'll often see it um, abbreviated ENSO, which stands for El Nino Southern Oscillation. And what happens is those westerly winds or those um, trade winds weaken and so they no longer push that warm water uh, across the Pacific towards uh, Southeast Asia because usually during a normal year these warm waters are going to cause the monsoons that provide the rainwater for growing food and when they get pushed off the coast you also have the cold water from the deep that upwells that helps the fishing industry in South America. Well during an El Nino when those winds weaken that water is no longer pushed over here and your monsoons are going to hit out in the middle of the ocean and the surface temperature next to South America is going to be warm and you're not going to get the upwelling. So not only does that affect the fishing industry, um, but also it's going to affect climate areas in other parts of the world. So here's a, um, another example of what happens. Um, you've got the, the surface winds that are blowing the ocean water westward and as the warm waters are pushed forward, the cold water from the deep rises to take its place. Now the weather patterns that occur, uh, you can see all the areas in orange, so the areas where the monsoons usually hit experience drought, but also not just in uh, the southern Pacific, but you see issues over here in Africa, over here in South America, you get extremely high rainfall in the southeast U.S., um, and then certain parts of the northeast and northwest United States have unusually warm periods. Because when you affect the ocean currents in one area of the ocean, that's going to affect the entire Earth because of the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt that we'll take a look at. Now, the next thing we're going to look at are thunderstorms. There's three stages. The first thing that happens is you have that warm moist air that rises, starts forming cumulus clouds, which are the big fluffy pretty white clouds that you usually see on fair days. Um, as the day goes on and you've got a hot day and you have more and more evaporation, your clouds are going to become a um, little more taller in height. We call these vertical clouds. This is the mature stage. So these are cumulonimbus clouds and you're going to start to have heavy rains. So when you have heavy rains that actually slows down the updrafts and it's followed by light rain and what is called the dissipating stage. Now, one thing you might have noticed, sometimes before a thunderstorm starts where you have these updrafts, you'll see the leaves of the trees blown upward and they often have that light green color because the underside of the leaf is lighter than the top side. Um, 
But then as soon as those heavy rains start, those updrafts slow down. Here's a, a side view of a cumulonimbus. You can see how tall it is and how it's grown vertically. Here's another view, and here you can see where the rain has started, so the updrafts are going to slow down. Lightning is usually associated with thunderstorms. Um, it's just a discharge of electricity. Uh, most lightning actually occurs just from cloud to cloud, um, and then occasionally it's going to go cloud to ground or cloud to tree. Um, but the reason that it happens, the lower part of the cloud builds up a negative charge, it has negative ions. Um, the top part of the cloud has positive. So what that does, the negative charges actually repel the negative charges in the ground so the top of the tree ends up with a positive charge. And so the electrons are attracted to the positive ions because opposite charges attract. Um, when that happens, the air instantly heats up so that it quickly expands and as soon as the, the electrons have jumped, it cools down and contracts. And it's that contracting air, that rushing noise that creates thunder. So whenever you hear thunder, thunder is caused by lightning. So that's why we you know, close swimming pools and um, cancel sporting events. Because even if you just see, or sorry, even if you hear thunder but don't see lightning, lightning is what causes thunder. But a lot of that lightning we don't see because it goes cloud to cloud, not cloud to ground. Tornadoes are one type of severe storm. Um, you have to have cumulonimbus clouds, so it has to be warm enough to, uh, to occur. So usually these start late spring. They can get up to 300 miles per hour. And at the center of the tornado, you have extreme low pressure. Remember, with low pressure, air rises. So that's what causes that suction uh, so the tornado can pick up things in its path. Um, usually, uh, they're less than half a mile wide. Very rarely, they get much larger than that. Um, and cover about 15 miles, sometimes less than that. But they can last anywhere from a few minutes to several hours, depending on the storm. About 800 to 1,000 per year occur mostly in what we call Tornado Alley, which are those states right down the middle of the U.S., like Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up to Nebraska. There is a scale that we use to measure tornadoes. It's called the Fujita Scale. Um, and it ranges from F0 to F5. F5s are pretty rare. Um, an F3 can take a roof off your house. And the tornado is simply the, the bottom part of the cumulonimbus cloud that reaches down to the ground. Now, a hurricane is a storm or a severe storm that forms over the ocean. These cause more property damage and loss of life than any other type of storm. And it's mainly the winds and the storm surge, which is the water that's washed in from the ocean, creates flooding. Uh, for a hurricane to occur, the ocean temperatures have to be pretty high, so it's usually July before the ocean is warm enough, and it lasts into November. So the water has to be higher than 80 degrees to produce enough evaporation to form, once again, cumulonimbus clouds. So you've got that low pressure that's constantly causing that air to rise. And then once the air gets above, it starts to um, move outward. If you have light winds that are coming in uh, perpendicular to that, that's what can start uh, causing it to move, causing it to spin. Now, tornadoes are going to weaken as they pass over cooler water, so they usually form all around the equator and move north, and they'll start to, the wind speeds will start to die down as the clouds are no longer forming, or when it hits land, the friction is going to slow down the wind speeds. The uh, scale that we use to measure hurricanes is the Saffir-Simpson, um, and it's category one to category five. So stages of a hurricane, they start off as basically a thunderstorm, which is a tropical depression or disturbance. Um, and as that uh, pressure continues to drop, you have more and more air rising at the center. Uh, when you have that low pressure center or the eye of the storm and it starts uh, moving inward and has that look like it's swirling, uh, that's when we call it a tropical storm. Tropical storms are going to have winds greater than 40 miles per hour. Once it reaches 74 miles per hour, that's when it's called a hurricane. The last thing that I want to look at um, are seasonal changes in microclimate. Seasonal changes uh, we've talked about before, um, but seasons depend on the tilt of Earth's axis. When we are tilted towards the sun, um, the northern hemisphere experiences summer and the southern hemisphere experiences winter. When we are tilted away from the sun, the northern hemisphere is in wintertime and the southern 
is in summer. In the autumn, uh, we are, we're not tilted toward or away. Same thing in the spring. And it's this difference in the northern and southern hemisphere that helps with the global air circulation patterns. Climate is, the, is different from weather. Weather are the day-to-day -day changes, but if we look at the averages over a long period of time, like average precipitation, average um, temperature, then that gives us the climate of an area. And usually we're going to take at least 30 years data to find that. So once again, we look at the temperature and the precipitation. Microclimates also exist depending on the topography of the earth. Topography is the shape of the earth's surface. Uh, so a microclimate is an area that has a different climate than the area surrounding it. Um, usually it's going to be affected by vegetation. Forests are going to stay warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer. Uh, cities have what is called an urban heat island um, because they trap heat. You've got more traffic, more greenhouse gases, you've got buildings that um, decrease the wind speed, very little evaporation and vegetation, so you get that urban heat island. Now we also have what are called um, sea breezes and land breezes, which are types of local winds. During the daytime, when the sand is hot or the land is hot, the warm air rises, so the cooler air from the ocean comes in to take its place. Um, we call these sea breezes because the, we name winds based on where they're coming from. So if it's coming from the sea to the land. Now at nighttime, the opposite happens. When the sun goes down, the sand cools down, the water stays about the same temperature. So now that air rises and the cool air from the land rushes in to take its place. So that would be called a land breeze. One last type of microclimate is the rain shadow effect. You've probably heard of the windward and leeward side of mountains. Um, if you're on um, the side facing the water, so the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle, is a great example. Um, you've got that um, wind that carries in the moist air off of the Pacific, and it's blocked by the Cascade Mountains. So this is the windward side, the side that the wind hits, and you've got all the cloud and the rains. When you get on the back side of the mountain, because those clouds were blocked, that's called the rain shadow, where you tend to have a much drier climate. And that's it for weather.